Okay, there we are. Okay, you should be able to see that share now. Do you see that one now? Yes. It should come up in a second. Okay. Sales of a property. Okay. The biggest thing to understand is the sale of a property um, typically involves an asset where you're going to be showing either a gain or a loss. Okay, it's a disposition of an asset. Um, first, I'm going to cover just the basic calculation of the sale, and then we'll go into all the details. But it's basically pretty simple to determine if you have a gain or a loss. It's the sales price uh, minus all the sales expenses. That's all the agent fees, the um, any existing mortgages, anything on a property, any existing loans, whatever it may be uh, that you have outstanding on the property. That equals the um, amount realized from the sale, okay? Then once you take off the cost and the basis that you had originally from the property, what you originally put into it, then you have either a realized capital gain or a loss, okay? It's very basic. That's the most basic formula there is. It's not complicated. It's very important that you understand this formula because there is a lot of questions on this exam about this. It's even on the LTC exam, it's on the uh, business exam. This is something that you have to understand. Um, this comes into play a lot with our customers who sell off a house, okay, when they're selling off a rental property. It's very important that you basically memorize this formula. God, it's really not complicated. It's not a hard formula. Simply the sales price. Whatever you have uh, it sold for if you're selling it for three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, it's very simple. Minus all the expenses, that equals your amount from the sale. Now, by sales expenses, there's a lot of things that fall into that. And we'll go into that in detail. But then you take off of that your cost or basis. That's what you're into the property. All right, and then you end up with your realized gain or loss. So, let's take an example. So, Jake sold a computer for a thousand dollars. He paid $100 to advertise his computer, and he originally paid $800 for the computer, and he has depreciated it already by $300. So let's take a look at it. The sales price is $100. Straight up, very simple. His sales expense was the $100 that he has put into it um, to get it advertised. That means that he has got, uh, from the sale, $900. His original cost, which is, remember, the $800 he originally paid for this sale minus what he's depreciated because he's gotten that $300 back in deductions. Okay, so his cost now is $500. That's what he has left in value in the property. So his amount of gain is $400 on this computer. 
Okay. That's what he, his gain is. All right. It's very simple. It's a positive amount. So it's a gain on this sale. All right. Here's another example. Uh, Jane bought a car several years ago for $20,000. She used it for personal reasons. Okay. She only used it for personal reasons. She sold it this year for $1,000 to her friend. So sales price was $1,000. Um, the sales expenses, nothing. She sold it to a friend. Uh, amount realized from the sale was $1,000. The cost was $20,000. The loss is $19,000. But remember something. This is a loss from the sale, but she used it for personal reasons. Okay. So is this considered a business expense? No. No. It has to be used for business expenses for it to be considered a business asset. So this is a loss, though, of $19,000. Okay? Hank bought a house several years ago for $200,000. He sold it for $250,000 this year. He paid 6% of the sales price to his real estate agent for the sale. All right? So $250,000. $15,000 in sales expenses, that's the, 15, that's the 6%, he got $235,000. Cost basis is so far, he um, is into it for $200,000. Now remember, the problem is he didn't depreciate or anything, so we're going to go into this in a little bit here about certain rules about a re rental property, but that's all right for right now. But he is showing a gain of $35,000 at this point, okay? So it's really basic. As long as you understand this formula, all right? Now, some realized losses can be deducted from your tax return, return and some cannot be deducted, okay? Some losses can only be deducted depending upon what they are. Now, here's one of the big things that you have to realize in regards to a lot of our customers. Rental properties normally do what in value? Uh -huh. A rental property, or if you have a house and you're, you have a, a rental property, what does the value of a rental property usually do over time? If I bought a house originally for $200,000 and I have it for eight years or whatever, eight years later, what is the value of the house usually? It's usually much higher. Okay. So when we assume we're going to depreciate a problem, a, a, a property, an asset, what do we usually assume about the property? It's going to go down in value, right? Yeah. But that's not true with rental properties. Uh, okay. Okay, think about it. A rental property, what happens to the value of a house normally? Normally increases, right? There's only been a few times where the value of the properties, like in 2008 when properties crashed, right? Most of the time, properties skyrocket in value. Okay, right now properties are going up. So even though we have properties that are um, that we're depreciating. Guess what's happening to the value of the houses? Because to, to the tax service, it's a depreciable property, isn't it? We're depreciating yes. it over 27.5 years, right? Yes. But what's happening to the actual value of the property? The it, rental went up. The rental's going up. Yeah. So what happens when you sell that property? You're going to mm -hmm. have a problem. You're going to have a recapture of depreciation. And I'm going to go into that in some detail because that's one of the few things that has that problem. Because rental property usually goes up in value and the IRS is assuming you're taking depreciation, you're going to end up paying for depreciation recapture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because what's going to happen is most houses go up in value. Okay. And so a rental property is the one exception to the rule. You've been 
you expect most things, you know, a car value drops down, right? Yes. A computer value drops down. The yes. equipment you have for your factory drops down in value. All these things are terrible. They all go down in value, right? But the rental property, you bought it, you've been renting it out, and you've been depreciating it. But guess what? It's the one thing you have that typically doesn't go down in value. It's normally going up in value. Mm. Yeah. So what happens is you've been taking that depreciation out of it. And here's the bad thing. Remember, there is allowable and allowed depreciation, right? So you have um, depre- uh, deductions that you are um, taking out because you're allowed to, right? Yes. What you have a choice not to deduct it, right? Uh -uh. You don't have to deduct it. But what happens if you don't deduct it? It is not depreciated. But in a uh, business, for business Uh purposes, it's still assumed to be deducted. The IRS assumes you're going to deduct a property. Okay. So you're going to end up basically paying that recapture amount no matter what. Mm. Okay. They're going to assume you deducted it. And unfortunately, when you are talking about the sale of a property, how much does the property go up over, say, five years, eight years, 10 years, 15 years? You're talking about a substantial amount it can have gone up in 15 years. Okay, you're talking about a whole lot of money it could have increased in value. And do you know what the penalty is for um, depreciation recapture? No. 25%. Uh-huh. So whatever the amount is that you are recapturing in bonus for that amount of depreciation, you're going to pay it in a penalty as an additional 25%. So it's the one thing that even though it's allowable for you to not take the depreciate the deduction for it, if it is a rental property that we're talking about, take the deduction. Because if you don't, you're still going to get hit for it. It's the one thing that's going to go up in value. So if we're talking about rental properties, take the deduction. Okay, other things you don't need to deduct. But honestly, if you have customers, clients that have it, have their income coming from rental properties, tell them to deduct it. Uh-huh. Because the IRS is going to assume basically that you have been deducting it. And they're going to make you pay a penalty no matter what in the year you take it out. Now, there are a couple of ways to try to get around it. But they're not exactly the best things in the world. We'll get into that in a little bit. That's when I explain rental properties. But um, realize something. The sale on a rental property is the one thing that can hurt you because it goes up in value. But how you calculate it is the same no matter what it is. All right? Now, some realized losses can also be partially deducted too. Remember, you can have a carry back or a carry forward. So if you have a net operating loss, it can actually help you in a sense if you are expecting uh, for something to, uh, for a better year the following year. Okay, so let's, we'll focus on that in a second. So let's figure this out again. If you do have a capital gain. Some realized gains are taxable, um, but some are also not taxable. Remember capital gains, we're gonna get into capital gains in a little bit, but we're just gonna focus on the sale for right now. Okay? So you have to figure out which gains are taxable and which are not. Okay, so we're gonna have to get into that in a second. Now, a recognized gain is the amount of the realized gain that is subject to tax. This is a realized gain. This is the raw amount. Okay? That's the difference between the two. A realized gain is 
what the actual dollar amount is. Okay, a realized gain is the actual total gain on a property. The recognized gain is how much is being recognized as being taxable. So you have to understand those two definitions because that's actually something that is basically on the test. Okay, because they're gonna ask you for those two definitions. That's one of the things that will come up. A realized gain or a loss is the actual total amount from the sale. Okay, the realized amount, the realized gain or loss is the actual calculated amount for the total amount. The recognized amount is how much is actually recognized as being taxable. Okay, so you have to understand there's two different words there. One is realized gain and one is recognized gain. One is, it's your real, and here's how you want to think about it. There's the real gain, okay? That's the real gain, that's the total amount. And then there's the recognized, which means that's how much you recognize, how much you actually see, okay? As being taxable for the tax return. So make sure you keep those two steps separate and make sure you put that into your notes. There's a realized gain and a recognized gain. All right, yes. so for the recognized gain formula, that's the realized gain minus the exclusion amount, and that's the amount that can be excluded from being taxed, okay? And that equals your recognized gain. Okay, see so that's where the two terms come in. The realized gain is what is, what is calculated um, from the formula. The recognized gain is what's left over, that it's actually recognized as being taxable. Okay? So that's the two additional parts. The realized gain minus the exclusion amount equals the recognized gain. All right? So let's see what, when we continue with this. So the, this is the exclusion amount. Okay, $35,000 can be excluded, which means his recognized gain is zero. Okay, now why would this be um, excluded? Because in a business sense, this was probably his personal residence. So it's not a business, it's not a business property. So he is not taxed on this, it's not considered excluded by, by a business, as a business asset. So this cannot be separate, this cannot be included in his business assets. So let's run through some questions on this. A sales price minus the sales amount gives you what? Amount realized from amount sale. Amount realized, very good. The amount realized gives you what? Minus the basis gives you? A realized gain or loss. There you go. So the realized gain minus the exclusion amount. It's the recognized gain. Now remember, this is the real gain minus the exclusion amount gives you the recognized gain. An exclusion amount is the same thing as which? Mm. A non-recognized gain. That means it's not recognized. Mm. Do you understand that one? An exclusion amount is an amount that is not recognized. It's not seen by the IRS as being taxable. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's go back over this one more time. Okay, because I want to make sure this is perfectly clear. So, if I'm going through this, if we bought an item, a, a car, 
$20,000. She used it only for personal reasons. Okay. She sold it um, this year for $1,000 to her friend. All right. So sales price was $1,000. Could she have any sales expense? Based on what we have here. Did she advertise no. or anything? Nope. So it's $0. So how much did she get from the sale? $1,000. Okay. How much was she into it for? How, many, how much did she buy it for originally? $20,000. $20,000. So if we subtract from the $1,000, we subtract the $20,000, her realized gain then, or loss, in this case it's a loss, she has a loss of how much? $19,000. $19,000. Okay. So again, in this case, Hank bought the house for $200,000. He sold it for 250000 this year. He paid 16% of the sales price to his real estate agent for the sale. Okay, the sales, uh, the sales price, $250,000. Okay, sales expenses, 6%, which is $15,000. Okay, so that gives him how much for his amount realized for the sale? The two hundred and fifty thousand minus the fifteen thousand is two hundred and thirty five thousand. Yes. Okay. Two hundred and thirty five thousand dollars. How much did it originally cost him? Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. So I to subtract two hundred thousand dollars from two hundred and thirty five thousand dollars, and I have a realized gain. Thirty five thousand. Thirty five thousand dollars. Now. Let's say that was all taxable instead, okay, that I couldn't exclude any amount. Then how much would be the recognized gain? I couldn't exclude any of it. It's all taxable, let's just say. 35000 Then it would be 35000 as his recognized gain. Okay. But like I said, some recognized losses can be deducted and some cannot be deducted. Some realized uh, losses can be partly deducted. Okay, some realized losses can be deducted, some cannot. Okay, and we'll get into that one. Like I said, some realized gains are taxable, some are not. Um, we'll get into this, which are gain and which are not taxable, which, are, which gains are taxable and which are not. And again, like I said, that's the recognized gain. By recognized, is, that is the amount you recognize as being taxable. Okay? So the recognized gain is the amount of the realized gain that is subject to tax. So it is the realized gain minus the exclusion amount equals the recognized gain. All right, so again, in that same house, let's say he was able to exclude uh, $35,000 for whatever reason. So his recognized gain then would be zero. Yes, zero. Okay, so the sales price minus the sales expense. That's your amount you realized from the sale. Okay. The amount realized minus your basis gives you your realized gain. The realized gain minus your exclusion amount gives you your recognized gain. And an exclusion amount is the same thing as your non-recognized gain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are we pretty straight up on that? We understand that pretty well? Yes. Okay, the reason I'm asking is because that's really important. Sales are a hard thing for a lot of people. And I know it's not something that a lot of people want to um, you know, they, they don't it, it, it's not something that you think about all the time 
but unfortunately you have to think about whenever um, whenever uh, uh, a property is sold typically. Oh, let me do this really quick. I'm trying. I'm trying to see what Victoria was doing here. Hello. Hey, are you getting on? Are you on the call? No, I'm not. Okay, because I saw you were logged in, but. Oh, I was, and then I was yeah, on I know. because I didn't run it working. Okay. I haven't been on. Because we're doing, teaching? yeah, we're doing sales and installment sales. This would actually be good for you to be on there. Oh, I got, I got 20 out of 20 last time. I took 30 out of 30. That is freaking retarded now. I'm just, I'm done with all of this crap. I'm taking it on the 18th. Okay. Like, I, I know that by the back of my hand because I've read the full publication twice for everything. <laughs> Okay. But I'll log in as well. Thank you. Okay. I'll log in right now. All right, bye. Bye. Mm. Okay. I've been reminded because this is an important thing. The installment sales um, is when property is sold and one or more payments are made after the close of the tax year. So, in other words, it's going to go longer than a tax year. Okay. Yes. Now, this is typically, now, you use the installment method when there is an installment sale that results in a gain, not a loss. Okay, that's a general rule. Mm -hmm. um, it, you don't do it when there's going to be a resulting loss. All right, so that's really important. So, if I am getting something and I'm getting, an, I'm getting payments on it, and what's going to happen is, is it is going to run um, past this tax year. I will be doing an installment sale. And that's, like I said, that's because the, the payments are going past the end of this year. So do not use the installment method to report the sale resulting in a loss a sale of depreciable property to a related person. Now these unfortunately are the rules you need to know. Um, they're very important to cover <clears throat> because what will end up happening is, is this will be the things you get tested on. Okay. Sale of inventory because that equals business income. Okay. That is not inventory items are not things that you um, uh, count in a sale. Okay, that, that is actually considered regular income. Um, uh, sale by dealer of personal and real property. That's again business income. Sale of a personal residence. Okay, that's if the gain is completely excluded. Uh, portion of the sale resulting in ordinary income due to depreciation recapture. This is a big one for you. The reason this is a big one is because most of our people do not have businesses as much as they have rental properties. For the business side, this is anybody who's a real estate investor. Okay. But for um, most of our regular individual returns, that will result in depreciation recapture. Now here's the problem. Depreciation recapture comes with a penalty. Yes. Okay. So you also do not use this for gain deferred under a like kind exchange. And I'm going to get into a like kind exchange um, a little bit here. Okay, because it's a very important thing to cover. And when a taxpayer elects not to use the installment method. Okay. There, Vicky's on. Okay. So you do not use the installment method to report these items. Ryan? Yes. You said penalty for depreciation recapture is 25%? Um, of it, what? It, it, it depends upon of the recapture amount. 
Ah, okay, of the recapture amount. Yes, of the recapture amount. Okay. And I will double check that amount uh, to make sure that that is still that that amount is still true for 2018. But um, but let's go over this. The installment method has three parts: interest, the gain on the sale, and the basis recovery. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Um, I have two clients that want to schedule an appointment with you. There we go. Okay, the installment method, the three things you're concerned about is interest, the gain on the sale, and the basis recovery. So, number one, so this is our, our, our installment sales. Calculate the total payments received during the year. Okay, this is just during the year itself, during the tax year. Determine how much of it was interest. Okay, so whatever the interest rate was, or whatever, um, if you have a fixed amount or if you have a just a percentage amount that was interest, uh, calculate how much of it was interest. Calculate the principal payments received. And that's just simply a matter of taking out the interest from the amounts of the payments. Calculate the gross profit percentage, okay? In other words, the actual uh, percentage as the profit in a percentage form Calculate the gain on the sale. So in other words, how much was made on the sale and then calculate the basis recovery amount. We're going to go into these in details. So calculate the total, repay, uh, total payments received during the year. The payments equals the principal plus the, plus, plus the interest. So you add together all the payments uh, received during the year. So if they were five payments, 10 payments, 15 payments, whatever it took during that particular year, okay, during the tax year. Um, now, again, you'll have additional payments in the years following because they're still making additional payments because, like I said, an installment sale goes past the existing tax year, but you're only concerned about the current tax year, okay? So determine how much of this was interest, all right? So what will end up happening is you have to determine how much of the actual amount was interest. And it's usually, like I said, on an amortization scale, because as you know, when you first start paying something, it will be um, the greatest amount usually at first, and then the less, lesser amount uh, towards the end. So you want to figure out what your loan amount was and how much each payment is then uh, based on its percentage of principal and interest. Okay, so you want to break it down. Uh, if no interest is charged or if the stated interest is less than what is required by federal law, the IRS will force you to treat part of the sales price as interest. Okay, so if there was no interest charged, okay, then you have to have imputed interest. In other words, they are assuming there will be some interest. Okay, so you have to assume there's going to be some portion as interest. Because most people do not give a loan for, with no interest. Yeah. Okay. So then you want to calculate the principal payments received. So that's the principal payments is the amount of the payments that are on the principal, not the interest itself. So the principal payments equal the total payments minus all the interest received. Okay. And that is the amount that was taken from the actual sales price. So calculating the gross profit percentage, the amount of each sale that is profit. So you want to take the gross profit over the contract price. Okay, the gross profit is the sales price minus the basis. So in other words, the sales price is what you have sold it for, okay? on the entire contract, the, the total amount, minus the basis. And that will be your percentage profit. Okay, the contract price is the sales price plus the liabilities assumed by the buyer and selling expenses uh, paid by the buyer. 
Okay, that's the total amount of all the expenses involved. That's the contract price. So now here's the important thing. You need to calculate the gross profit percentage in the year of, year of the sale. That's it. Um, use that same percentage for each year thereafter. Okay, that's what you want to make sure is you have that same percentage year after year. All right. And then calculate the gain on the sale. Now the gain will be the uh, in the principal payments received times the percentage profit, the the, the uh, gross uh, profit percentage. Okay, so that's how much you figure out of each profit, uh, of the profit margin on, on each one. You have to figure out um, the gain on the sale using that calculation. Now, sometimes that gross profit over the contract price is a little bit harder to calculate, but I'll actually go over it with you so then it's a little bit easier. All right, and then to calculate the gain on the sale, the gain equals the principal payments received times that uh, percentage profit, and you are calculating the amount on this year's gain from this year's payments received. So you don't do it on the total amount, you're only doing it on this year's payments. Because it's an installment law, it's one that goes past this year's tax, uh, tax year. Okay. Then the basis recovery amount is the amount each payment that is a return of your basis. So it is your principal payments received minus the gain on the sale. Okay. So it is your payment uh, principal received minus the gain. So that is your overall um, recovery on your basis. And we're going to get into that in an example here. So, okay. On May 1st, 2018, Walter agreed to sell land uh, to Ian for $12,000. His basis in the land is $7,200. It was paid uh, over five years at 5% interest rate at $226 and uh, 45 cents per month. Now this includes the principal and interest. This was starting June 1st, 2018. According to the loan schedule, $334.43 was interest. All right, so let's start mm -hmm. figuring out how we do this. So we calculate the total payments received during the year. So it's principal and interest times the number of payments. Okay, so it's 226.45 times the seven payments because he started June 1st. So we got seven payments received. So the total amount we had coming in was $1,585.15. Okay. So it's really pretty simple here. We've got from here, our principal and interest is this amount, the amount per month, times the fact that this started on June 1st. So we're going for seven months for the year which gives us a total of the 1585.15. So how much was interest? We know, according to the loan schedule, $334 um, was interest, okay? Yes. So this amount, we, we actually just, we've been given this amount, okay, so we don't have to look it up. So interest was $334.43. Mm. Okay, so calculate the principal amounts received. So the principal amounts received is the total payments received minus the interest received. So we received 1585.15 minus 334.43, which is right there, and we get $1,250.72. Okay, pretty simple here. Yes. All right. So, next we have to calculate the um, 
the gross profit. Now this is a little bit harder. Okay, mm -hmm. our GPP, which is our uh, gross profit percentage, is the sales price minus basis over the sales price plus liabilities plus selling expenses. So what did we have here? Our sales price was $12,000. His basis yes. was 7,200. All right. His sales price plus the liabilities, which there were no liabilities, there were no selling expenses. So it's 12,000 minus the 7,200, because that's his basis for the land here, over, now there are no liabilities, there are no selling expenses, so the only one we have is the sales price. So it's over 12,000, so it's 4,800 over 12,000 equals a 40% uh, gross profit percentage. So let's calculate the gain on the sale. So what did we have? Our gain on the sale is the principal payments received times the GPP. All right, so where do we get this number? Principal payments received, which we said was from, let's go back here one, principal payments received was, this is on just the principal, so we took the interest out. So total payments received was this, interest received was $334, so the, the principal payments was the 1272. Yes. Interest received. Right. So we, this is just the principal times 40%. So our gain on the sale based on this was $500.40. Yes. All right. So what does that mean for us here? So calculate the basis recovery amount. The basis recovery amount is the principal payments received minus the gain on the sale. So this is how much we're recovering from for our basis. So we know the principal mm -hmm. payments amount was the $1,251, because that's the amount we received minus the interest, okay, minus the, the gain. gain on the sale, which we know yeah. we've gained 500 bucks. Yeah. So our basis recovery amount is seven hundred and fifty-one dollars. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So, what does that number actually mean in real terms? When we talk about basis recovery amount, we're trying to recover that seventy-two hundred dollars, right? Yes. So, to calculate that amount, how much we're recovering for our tax return deduction, because we're recovering part of it, we want to figure out how much we take off of our taxes. That's how much we take off of our taxes for this particular year. Okay. That's what we're looking for. The pro the, that's what this whole purpose is. Uh, when we think about what is the purpose of what we're doing here. So if we're looking back on this, what is the purpose of doing this installment sale? The installment sale is to try to calculate how much we deduct from our taxes based on a sale. Now, how are we going to do that? We have to take what we sold it for, how much we're into it, take out all of our um, things like the interest because we don't get the recovery on an interest. And what we're trying to do is figure out the yearly amount from the basis. Okay. So to do that, we're going to figure out what percentage of gain we have. All right. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to take the total amount of payments received for the year, not for the whole thing, but for the year. Mm. Okay, because we're only doing it for the tax year. And then for those seven payments we receive for the year, we get $1,500, okay? Because that's the total amount we had come in. Now we need to take the interest out of it. So we eliminate the interest there. We take that out of the equation. So we end up with 
be twelve hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Okay, and that's how much goes against our um, actual principal. That is this amount. This is not the interest. This is our um, sales price right here. This is the twelve thousand dollars. Okay, and we're trying to figure out of that twelve thousand dollars what our gain is and what we get to recover from this basis. Okay, so this is how much we made towards our principal because we took this interest out of it. Now as we continue, this is our percentage. So this is a percentage gain per year is what it's figuring. What is our percentage gain on the item well we're gaining about 40 percent so how do you figure out the percentage gain in regular terms okay it's the sales price minus the basis so how much am i going to make on it that's what it's asking what would this number basically be in real terms the sales price minus the basis well that's how much money i'm making right yes this is how much i, I got for gross it this profit. Is how much gross profit right there this is how much I'm getting off of it. So that's your gross profit. Your contract price is what it basically costs you in the, uh, to sell it. Okay, that's the total that it costs you for everything to sell the property. All right, because that's what you're trying to figure out is of what percentage did it cost me to sell the whole property? And that'll give me a percentage. So that'll tell me, okay, that's the percentage. So I can look at that percentage each year and say, okay, of my amount that I'm getting, 40% of that is gain. Yes. Okay. So now when I get my calculation then, my gain, and that's what I'm calculating here, is I'm taking my total payments times the 40% so I can figure out this is the gain in a percentage form. This is a gain in the actual dollars. Okay, so what does that leave me with? If this is the gain that I made, right? Yes. And this is how much I got. It was the $1,251, right? What's left over if I take this $500 out? That's my basis. Right? Because if this is my gain, yes. and this is how much money I got out of it, all right, then whatever's left over from these two should be my cost. So let's take a look at that and let's see how that works dollar amounts. And that's exactly what it's saying is. If I take from the amount of money I had come in from it, the $1,251, that is what I got minus any interest because interest doesn't help me. Interest is just what he's paying me to borrow it. So that $1,251 minus my gain on it, this is my basis, right? Yes. So that is the basis recovery amount. And what would I need to do with that basis recovery amount? That's the amount I get to deduct because I'm trying to recover my basis, right? That's the amount I get to deduct in that year. Mm -hmm. That's the amount that I have that is allowable to me that I can take off of that income is what happened. I had $1,251 come into me, right? Yes. Now, that means I would have to pay taxes on $1,251. But remember, that land cost me $7,200 to start. Well, I've already paid taxes on the $7,200. I don't want to pay taxes on it again. I've already paid taxes on it. I only want to pay taxes on the amount that I'm gain, that, that's my gain. So that's what the whole purpose of this is, is for this year, how much was my gain? 
Well, my gain was this amount. This amount is then the amount I've already paid taxes on. So I don't need to pay taxes on it again. So that's the amount I no longer have to pay taxes on. Does that make it a little bit clearer? You don't have to pay taxes on the gain? And you have to pay taxes on the gain. Remember this, I have to pay taxes on. This is my basis recovery amount. This is what I've already paid taxes on. Oh, yeah. For the basis, okay. for the right. basis, you don't have to pay taxes. Right. Because you don't have to pay taxes on this again because this is my amount from the $7,200. This is this year's percentage from the $7,200 that I originally paid for the land. Okay. This amount is the only amount that I have to pay taxes on. That $500. I got a check. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I got, got a it. check. I got a check for one thousand two hundred and fifty-one dollars. Yes. Plus interest. Okay. Plus the interest. So I actually got a check total. If I think about it. Okay. Yes. Uh, I got. Five. I got a check for the fifteen hundred. Yes. And and uh, eighty-five dollars and fifteen cents. That's how much I got this year. Okay. I got checks yes. totaling that amount. But I need to take two things out of that check to find out how much I owe taxes on. I need to take out of it the interest. Interest. And I need to take out of it the basis. Gain. I have basis. And the basis okay. I need to take out of it. So I'm only paying taxes on my gain, right? Yes. So I know how to figure out my interest. In this case, I look it up in the amortization table. And it looks like my interest was $334. Cool. Okay. I either calculate it or whatever it may be, but whatever it took, I figure out my interest and I take it out. So I take out the interest amount. So that's my principal amount, right? Yes. Now out of that, I've got two parts. I've got my gain and I've got my basis, right? Yes. So I don't want to take, I don't want to pay taxes on my basis anymore. Yes. So I have to take my basis out of it. So now what I need to do is calculate my basis for the year. So here's how I'm going to calculate my basis. I'm going to figure out my gain percentage profit. Now this is overall. This is, it looks like my gain for the whole contract. Okay. Is 40%. And that's pretty simple. That's just whatever amount I'm making on the whole contract, which is the sale price which I knew here what it started is $12,000 is what I sold it for. And I had paid $7,200 originally for it minus uh, over all of the things it cost me to sell it. Okay. The sales price plus the liabilities plus the um, uh, selling, selling expenses. expenses. So what ends up happening is I end up with a percentage. So it looks like, 40% of my overall, so of this $12,000 that I'm getting, 40% is profit, is gain. Right? Yes. That's basically what that's saying. It's 40% of this is gain. So what I do then is I take my, from my principal, I've already taken the interest out of it. So of that $1,251, what is my 40%? 500 bucks. Okay. So 500 bucks is, is a gain. That's the amount I need to pay taxes on. Right. And yes. that leaves me with the amount that I'm recovering for this part. My basis. Okay. Very simple. Okay. Yeah. So installment loans are actually not very hard at all. They take a little bit of a calculation yes. because there are two <laughs> steps. Because they're, but what you're doing is you're taking what my total sales price is minus my basis minus my uh, interest. Interest. 
leaves me with my gain on the property. That's how much I'm getting taxed on. I've got a basis recovery amount. That is how much I deduct from it. So for me, that is what I'm deducting is that $751 because that amount I don't have to be taxed on. I've already paid taxes on it, right? Yes. I paid that with, that's the money I used to buy the property. Now, am I going to pay uh, taxes typically on the interest? It's no. income to me. It's income to me. So I'll end up paying interest on it. I'll pay taxes on it, but it falls into a different category. And if I can offset the expenses there, then who knows? But that's a maybe category. But I know I have to pay it on those gains. But what's important about the gains? Because what's the difference between the interest and the gains? That's your profit. Uh -huh, but here's, here's, here's one thing. What is interest and what is gains? Interest is regular income, isn't it? You're making money off of your money, right? Okay. Capital gains gains is capital gains and what happens with capital gains it's taxed at a whole different rate capital gains are usually taxed at about 15 percent aren't they ah uh, yeah so you want to have as much as capital gains as very little as interest and you know because you don't want to be taxed on anything but capital gains is much better to be taxed at a capital gains rate than anything else right yes so great you want to be taxed at capital gains rate. Because lower, gains, yeah. Yeah, lower, it's a lower rate. It's fifteen percent okay, usually. Yeah. All right. So that's an important thing. Capital gains is normally at a lesser uh, lesser amount. So let's take a look at this. How do we report the capital gains? Okay. How do we report the capital gains? Get this over here. So we calculate and report it on the form 6252. That's profit or loss. Okay, so that's cap cal calcul calculating a capital gain. And the amount calculated would transfer to either the Schedule D as a capital gain or the form 4797 as gain from the sale of a business or income producing property. Now for it to go on the Schedule D, it means you have a sole proprietorship, typically, or a partnership, you know, like a pass-through, that sort of thing. Mm. Right? Yes, but if you actually have, if you actually have a uh, C-Corp, it's going to go on a Form 4797. Okay, that's the gain from the uh, sale of a business or income-producing property. Okay, so C Corp does this. A C Corp does the form 4797. A sole proprietorship does a Schedule D. Okay, pretty simple. So how to report interest received. Now that this is why, like I said, capital gains is different than uh, interest. Okay. Okay, so you have to separate the two because the capital gains is at a lower rate. So how to report interest received? It's reported on Schedule B. Okay, it's similar to reporting interest of other sources. Interest income. Yeah. Interest income. All right, so you're getting it, girl. Yeah. Okay. Now, you can choose not to use the installment method. If you choose not to use the installment method, you can report the entire gain in the year of the sale and report it on either Schedule D or the Form 4797, depending on which one it's coming from. Because if it's a sole proprietorship, you can report it on a Schedule D as capital gain or on the Form 4797 as gain from the sale of a business or property. If it's a uh, 
C Corp or one of those, a non pass through. Okay, does that make pretty good sense? Yes. Okay, so installment loans are really not that hard. But they do take a little bit of understanding on how to calculate them. All right, so the interest, the installment loan has three parts, which is the following is not one of them. So interest is not one of them. Gain on a sale, uh, interest is one of them. Gain on a sale is one of them. And the basis recovery is one of them. So it's the allowable loss. Yes, allowable loss. Okay. When you have a gain on the sale of a personal residence that is completely excluded from the tax, you should not report it using the installment method. This is true. Remember, it's excluded from tax. It has a zero amount. Because installment method is only to be reported if there is amounts going multiple years. Okay. So if you have a gain on an installment sale and you choose not to use the installment method, how should you report it? On the year of sale. In the year of the, in the year sold. So you want to report the entire amount in the year that it was sold. Okay. And if you have a capital gain, on which do you report it? So if you're a sole proprietor, schedule D. Mm -hmm. If C Corp form forty seven ninety seven. There you go. So technically, this is actually not a good one because both answers are true depending upon which you which you are on. Uh -huh. So, okay. So if you have um, sale of income producing property, because this is actually, um, if you have a capital gain, it's asking you personally is what it's implying. If you have a personal capital gain is what it should say. You mm -hmm. report it on the Schedule D. If you have a gain from the sale of an income-producing income property, you report it on which form? And that's the 4797. Mm -hmm. All right. You did awesome on that. You did great on that. Now that was pretty good because literally in one hour you learned more about sales and installment sales than most people actually know totally. Yeah. Okay, that's very good, girl. I'm not kidding, that was very good. All right, on with the next section. Now, this is let's go into the details about the sale of the property. And this is where it gets a little bit different because there's some additional parts to the sale of assets that is not really included in that. So let me go over here. And okay, now. The publication you want to think about the most is, is the publication 544, and I've actually got it for you right here. Let me get this out to you. Um, where did my IRS docs go? I just had it here. Oh, I love it. I just had it up here and now I walk away. Uh, okay.
Ah, there it is. Hello, I can't find something. All right, and publication 544 for this tax year. <laughs> Casualty and theft, depreciation. Basis of assets, there we are. All right, and let me start uploading it. It should take one second. Okay, that did not save it anywhere where I thought it was going to save it. So we'll do that one more time. Okay, now luckily this is not a very large document. It actually is only about a total of about 30 pages long, 35 pages long. This is an important one to know for business. Okay. Um, reporting a gain or a loss with this, the sale of assets is very important. Um, Back up. Okay, so there are many different ways that a business can just dispose of an asset. Now mm -hmm. it can be sold, traded, abandoned, exchanged. Um, it can be gifted, it can even be destroyed. Um, now this may be as a result of some outside force, but sometimes it is something beyond the control of a business. And as a result, it is something that happens that the business actually just has to um, handle the loss of the asset. Okay, sometimes one of the other things that will happen is it is actually lost involuntarily. So in other words, sometimes it is lost in a lawsuit. Okay, now that's an important thing because a lot of times a, a uh, business gets sued for various reasons and as part of the settlement, they will actually lose part of an asset or lose an asset that is... Um, something that they you know hadn't anticipated so they actually have to uh, treat the disposition of the assets differently than a regular individual taxpayers because this is a gain or a loss from the actual um, 
not just from the taxes, but from it's considered basically an expense, and as it were. Okay, it's a deduction, but it's it's part of their itemized deductions in regards to that particular form. They have to recognize it that way. So a business may recognize a gain or a loss for tax purposes if it sells it as an asset for cash, exchanges the business property for another property. Now this is very important. This is part of a 1031 exchange. Okay, and I'm gonna go into a 1031 exchange because it's one of the ways you can avoid the capital gain. Like we were talking about, about the rental property. And I'm gonna go into that um, in a second. Um, if it receives payment from a tenant for the cancellation of a lease, okay? So it's treated as if it were the sale of a property. If it receives property to satisfy a debt, in other words, somebody owes you money and to pay it, they actually um, get that property, okay? It's the sale of it. Um, it. If it's abandoned property, if the property ends up being abandoned for tax purposes or whatever reason, or they lose the property due to it being damaged or or theft. Okay. So a business can fully depreciate an asset until its adjusted basis is zero. Okay. Now it can can you continue to use the asset after it is zero. It doesn't mean it takes it out of service. Now that's an important thing because it may determine how many years you want to depreciate something for. So if it is not specified, assumably after seven years, I mean, think about it this way. How many computers do you know last more than five years? A lot of them will, okay? And you can continue to use it. So it's giving you that benefit past its actual taxable life. Well, that's great. Those are just additional years of usage and income. Um, you can treat the gains or losses reportable for tax purposes. It's dependent upon whether the gains or losses are classified as capital gains or losses or ordinary income. Okay, now that's really important. All right, if it's, remember we were talking about ordinary income versus the capital gains and losses, interest off of it would be ordinary income where capital gains would be an amount um, that goes off of your overall, um, it's an amount above and beyond your basis that you've gained on the property, okay? So capital gains for individual taxpayers, the long-term capital gains may be uh, subject to more favorable tax gains. Unlike individuals, C-Corps do not get the preferential treatment for long-term capital gains. Now, that one's really important, okay? This is really, really important. So if it's a pass-through and passing through to, your, to you, capital gains is at a lower tax rate. But for C-Corps, C-Corps do not get the, ben the benefit of the ad additional tax difference for capital gains that individuals do. Okay, corporate capital gains are simply added to the corporation's ordinary income and taxed at the corporation's regular tax rate. All right, it's, it's only 21 percent. Yeah. Correct, correct. Now, they do have what benefit though? What do corporations get to do that an individual doesn't get to do? Think about it, what do, what do corporations get taxed on? Corporations get taxed on what's left. Remember it? So is that gonna affect them so much? Because their expenses override that. They take their expenses off of any capital gains. Um. Because remember, how does, it, how does it work for the expenses for a business. All business expenses get taken off of all income, which means all of their capital gains, before they get taxed on it anyways. So they may never get taxed on it. If they have expenses which are sufficient enough to, to uh, overcome 
their capital gains, they don't pay taxes on it anyway. Mm. Okay. That's a major, major advantage, isn't it? Okay. So think about that. A C Corp. Now, think about that major thing. If you have a property, if you have rental properties in a C Corp or under a C Corp, where is those, where are those expenses going to go to? What, where are those gains? I'm sorry. Where are those gains going to go to? The corporation. Those corporations. But what is going to be deducted from those gains? The expenses. All the expenses of the company before they ever get taxed on it. Mm -hmm. Now, with an individual, what happens? Those capital gains, they are going to get taxed on and you just get a deduction off of it, right? Yeah, because it is passed through. Because it's passed through. Very good. So there are ways around it, remember, with a C-Corp even. So it may sound bad. You go, oh, my God, they don't have the preferential um, amount for a C-Corp, right? Yes. Does it make a difference? No, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever because all of your expenses go off against it, which is the greatest thing in the world. Okay? Why do you think we have C-Corps? Okay? All the expenses come off before the taxes. Which, if you think about it, remember a long time ago when I said, who wants to get taxed on their profits? Right? You never want to get taxed on your profit. Because then you get, you know, you, when, when you own a business, let's say you're the owner of a C-Corp, and you get that double taxation. Yes. Well, remember, if you structure it the right way, are you ever going to get taxed on it? <laughs> no, you're never going to get taxed on it. You're only taxed on profits. Okay? So if you make sure that your amount coming out of it is coming out of it as, say, a draw, do you get taxed on that twice? Mm. No. You don't get taxed on a draw twice because that's your salary from it. You, get, you don't get taxed on it twice because that's an expense to the C-Corp. So it all depends on how you write it up. That's the most important thing. It all depends on how you write up the expense. If it's a draw from the company, you don't get taxed from it. It's an expense. Okay. I mean, sure, if it comes out as a profit, guess what? You get taxed on it at the company. Then it comes to you as a profit. Guess what? It's now income to you. You get taxed on it again. Looks pretty bad that way, doesn't it? Yes. You don't want to think about it that way. You don't want it coming to you that way. But if you structure it the right way, is that ever going to happen to you? No. You just have to know how to structure it the right way. So the, that is one of the most important things that you understand is that the structuring of a business determines how much your profit is. Uh, God, we're getting all kinds of background noise. I'm getting background noise in my headset. All right. Let's do this. It's 1230. Let's take a 10 minute break really quick because I got to run to the restroom quick and then let's uh, come back in just 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Does that work? Okay. Yes. All right. Be back in 10 minutes. All right. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go back to where we were. And I actually, I now have a class going to start for some people who want to do a fast paced version of the individual for the EA. I'm going to be teaching it just on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So. Okay. Later. Uh, just no, I'm going to, I already have the LTC class in the afternoon. I'm going to be doing that on Tuesdays and Thursdays at this same time. 
Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So let's get back into this. Now, as I said, when you have capital gains, all right, a business must be determine whether it is a capital asset or a non-capital asset um, or a section 1231 asset. And we'll cover all those in a second here. But capital gains and disposition losses um, on the sale of assets go on to the 4797 form for the sale of a business property. Okay. So capital assets include personal use assets, um, collectibles, investment properties, such as stocks, bonds, and other securities. Okay. That's very important. Okay. Those are considered capital assets. All right. So a capital assets are personal use assets. Okay. Nice. Okay, now tax law divides investment profits into different classes depending upon their holding period and the type of assets. So capital losses from the sale of stocks are generally uh, deductible up to a certain limit. But the losses from the sales of personal use property is not deductible. So that's one of the things you have to understand. Capital losses from the sale of the stocks are generally deductible. Now there is limits. But the uh, um, losses from the sale of personal use property are not. Now, non-capital assets are assets that are used in the trader business um, or as a rental property are called, the, they, these are assets that are used um, on a regular basis, okay? They're inventory, uh, depreciable property used in a business, um, real property used in a trader business. Now those are the commercial buildings or residential rental properties. Um, self, uh, self-produced copyrights, um, drawings, photographs, okay? Uh, accounts receivable or notes received acquired by the business. That one's a big one, okay? Yes. Because accounts receivable, that actually counts as a non-capital asset, okay? Stocks and bonds held by um, professional security dealers because stocks and bonds are considered their inventory. Yes. Okay. They are, ha but it's only by professional securities dealers. Um, collectibles. Now this is only true if it's held by a professional dealer. Okay. So in other words, collectibles like coins and antiques, a normal person holding them, it doesn't ca count as a non-capital asset. Okay. That's normally considered personal property. But if it's held by an actual antiques dealer or a coin collector or a coin dealer, then it is actually part of their inventory. Uh, business supply, commodities, and derivatives and financial, uh, financial instruments. Those are considered non-capital assets because they are ones that are being used in the day-to-day -day working of a business. Okay. Yes. Then the section 1231 assets um, include certain business assets that have been held for more than one year, as well as certain business and investment property disposed of in an involuntary conversion. This is depreciable business assets that have been held for more than one year. Real estate, buildings, farmland, uh, farmland used in business, this is important. Natural resources such as timber, coal, domestic iron ore, okay. Most livestock held for draft breeding or dairy, okay? Um, unharvested crops of a farming business, okay? Because that's considered potential income, okay? That's their inventory, basically. Um, now, the, spe the tax code gives special treatment to transactions involving disposition of section 1231 assets. Um, if the, a taxpayer has a net loss from all section one, two, three uh, transactions, the loss is treated as ordinary loss. Okay. If a section one, two, three, one transaction results in a net gain, the gain is normally treated as a long-term capital gain. Okay, so that's very yes. important. Um, now there is a more favorable tax treatment uh, since ordinary losses are not limited 
and the capital gain tax rates are more favorable than the rates for ordinary income. But that's not the case for depreciation recapture um, or un any unrecaptured section uh, 1231 losses that have been claimed in the prior five years. Okay. Both are taxes as ordinary income. Yes. Okay. Gain or loss on the following transactions are subject to the 1231 treatment sale or exchange of cattle and horses. Okay. That is important. This is mainly items that are not, um, these are specific items. They have specific rules based upon what they are. A lot of them have to do with farming, okay? Mm. Sale or exchange of cattle and horses. Now they must be used for draft, breeding, dairy, or sporting purposes. What do you mean by draft? Draft are the actual uh, workhorses, um. okay? You remember, you know, that you've seen the Budweiser um, Clydesdale, those great big horses with the great big legs and hoofs, and they pull the wagons. That's a draft horse. Okay. okay. The great big ones used for working. It's a carryover law from really when horses were used for uh, hauling things around. Okay. That was a draft horse. Now, breeding is pretty simple. A lot of horses' uh, studs are used for their semen. So oh, yeah. that, that horse is not actually used for anything other than that. And then a lot of mares are used only for breeding. Okay, so, um. they, can produce, uh, so they can produce other foals and for the horses. The same holds true for cattle. A lot of times they will have a specific number of cattle which are breeding heifers, okay? They produce the next year's stock. They don't butcher them. They just have them produce uh, calves year after year, mm -hmm. okay? And so that's what their job is. They're not used for dairy or things like that typically. They're, they are just bred every year, okay? Or they're bred and used for dairy, that sort of thing. Um, and their offspring is usually used if they have uh, heifers, they're used for breeding as well to expand the actual herd. If they're, um, if they're male, then they're used for, uh, they're usually clipped and used as beef. Okay. okay. Dairy, same thing. Now, sporting purposes is typically like horse racing and that sort of thing. That's yes. one of the things that where, where, um, horses are used for sport. Dogs are still used for dog racing. There are still things where animals are used for sport. Um, there aren't too many things, but there are several. Um, now, the sa now, this is just cattle and horses, but there is also the sale or exchange of other livestock. This is hogs, sheep, goats, donkeys, and other fur-bearing animals. Now there's a key point in there, fur-bearing animals, because a lot of times things like fish, as you know, a fish farm has become really popular lately. But fish farms have not been the same thing because usually it's one season. Um, okay. They usually are not going multiple years. They usually have a nine month growth, growth period that sort of thing. So they're usually less than one full year. Some, depending upon what you have, you know, trout, tilapia, that sort of thing, they usually only keep them one year. Uh -huh. That's why they're not really huge when they're harvested. They're, you know, they're, they're usually only one year. Cattle, most cattle are two to three years. You know, they're usually butchered after two full years. So they do go longer than one year. Horses cannot be ridden for the first two years, or they end up swayback. So they end up being bred, grown for two years. That's when their working life takes over, and then they're good for about three years. In a lot of cases, they're actually good for a lot longer than that, but that's their depreciation period for a racehorse is three years. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. And that's why. It's the growth of them. Um, Goats, hogs. Hogs are usually 
two years. Okay, it takes two years basically to grow them up. Um, but fur-bearing animals is normally minks, things like that that you would grow for coats, pelts, things like that. Fox. All right. So those are special ones that get treated as a one, two, three, one treatment. Now this is, you know. How about the unharvested crops of a farming business? That is one it less than one year. Um, More this than one is, year. They must be usually they're less than one year, but it gets treated. Um, because it's usually less, the seeds are normally harvested the previous year. So they basically count its growing period as a full year because you normally mm -hmm. harvest it in the fall and start prepping it uh, in the fall for planting. So the seeds are basically harvested in the fall of the previous year and planted in the spring. So you do keep them for a full year. Okay. Uh, so that's how they basically treat it as if it's one year. So um, it's really important. You have to have hold, held the land for more than a year. Um, so it's the, just, it, it's, it's primarily they count it based on the land itself. The how long preparation. It. Yeah. Right, the preparation. So um, it's kind of like that's kind of a, a little bit, because of the growing season. I mean, corn is actually um, a mainly a summer crop. You plant it in early spring and it comes up by fall. Okay. Mm. You know, th that's how it works. You know, th that's true with a lot of crops. So it is considered your asset until it gets harvested. So, okay. Now, that's a little bit different in those cases. Now, again, like I said, most of these are used in farming and that's because they are not, they don't have a real long life more or less. All right. But because they fall under that whole thing, you do have expenses. You do have things um, that extend past the normal length of time because most people don't see all the preparation work that goes in beforehand. Okay. Cause most people don't realize you have to prep the seeds, you have to prep the fields. Um, it's not just the grow time itself. Okay. So you are constantly doing it no matter what. Okay. Even in the winter you have prep of the seeds. That's when you're starting to sprout them. Um, a lot of things, a, a lot of them are actually live planted. In other words, they actually, plant them in a uh, in a greenhouse situation and then they put the seedlings in they don't actually put in new plant they don't put in just seed they actually plant seedlings in the spring okay to, to push it along farther so they'll use the a greenhouse to grow it up so all right um the sale or exchange of depreciable property Okay, this is business property that's held for more than one year. This is the normal things. Um, machinery and trucks, as well as amortized section 197 tangibles, such as patents or copyrights. And the sale and exchange of business real estate. Now that one is really important because that one also usually has a 1031 exchange. And that one's really important and we're gonna get into a 1031 exchange. All right, normally any net gains on a section uh, 1231 transactions for the year are treated as long-term capital gains, giving these types of transactions a favorable tax treatment. However, if there are any net 1231 losses in the prior five years, those prior five-year losses change the character of the 1231 gains in the current year from long-term capital gain to ordinary income. Okay, that is very important because it will change the taxing of it if in the previous year, five years, okay, there are any net losses in the previous prior five tax years, those prior five-year losses change the character of the 1231 gains 
into ordinary income instead of long-term capital gain. Mm -hmm. And that will change um, your tax basis. And that is not a good thing. Okay, because you will suddenly get taxed as ordinary income. Okay, and that's very important. All right, so and we're going to go over this. Like <laughs> they do that to prevent people from collecting a net loss in one year and then showing a huge net gain in the next year and only getting taxed on it as a net gain because you sold it off the next year. Mm -hmm. All right. So what ends up happening is if you showed a net loss in the previous five years, um, you cannot show it showed as ordinary income. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's so that you can't do the um, thing where all of a sudden this year you have this incredible amount of gains from a sale of a whole bunch of equipment. Okay. Like you were planning on it. So it's to prevent people from doing that. So you end up actually paying your fair share of taxes. All right. This is getting into it in detail. This is actually something I want to cover. Oh yeah, this is getting depreciation recapture too. And then like kind exchanges, the 1031 exchanges. Um, all right, it's one o'clock. I'm going to call it quits there for today because what we're about to get into is really detailed and I want to go into this in some detail. Um, we already covered how to calculate the sale on it. I don't want to go into it too far because it will start throwing you way off because what I'm about to cover is really detailed. Okay, so we're going to cover that on Friday. What is that again? We well, on Friday, I'm going to cover um, the last part, the, tw the detail part of the 1231 exchanges as to what actually counts for what and why we end up with it. But then I'm going to cover the depreciation recapture, um, a 1245 versus a 1250 extension what a 1245 property is, what a 1250 uh, property is. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, because that's... 1245 property and then... Right. A 1250 extension. And then we're going to get into the section um, 1031 like exchanges because that one is really... Um, 1031 or 1231? A 1031 exchange. That's a like uh -huh. property exchange. I that one is really exchange. Yeah, that one's actually really important because 1031 exchanges are really, really um, an important uh, part of what we do. A 1031 exchange is really, a, a really important. And I've got a whole section on what the true parts of a 1031 exchange because most people don't understand it. Yeah, okay. Okay. So let's do this. We're going to be meeting here again on Friday. Okay. All right. And I got to get a hold of Amanda and uh, Lisa and remind them all. And I got to go a hold of and Sheila. Sheila. Yeah. Sheila. I got to go a hold of Sheila and find out where she's at because I don't know what's going on. Okay. Thank you, so, Ryan. You got it, dear. Hey, I have a question. Yeah. Um, well, I've got her phone number. Have you talked to Laura lately? Laura? Yeah, have you talked to Laura lately? No. I've been trying to get a hold of her, and I cannot seem to get a hold of her. Do she's you want to off her. the recording? Yeah, yeah. Hang on one second. And yeah, then we you. talk. Yeah, let me. <laughs>